Concrete Pumping Code of Practice 2019 webinar. This is a presentation to give a brief overview of the new Concrete Pumping Code of Practice. So when was the Code of Practice originally released? In 2005 this, this occurred and of course years pass, technologies change, things in the industry change and also legislation changes. So after a few years we saw that the Code of Practice needed a review and in, two, in June 2015 employer and worker representatives made a joint submission to the then Minister for Industrial Relations requesting a review of construction related codes of practice and the concrete pumping code is one of those codes of practice. The proposal was approved and a steering committee was formed. So who made up that steering committee? Well, it's important that you get different opinions from different parts of the industry. It's important to get the views of employer groups. It's important to get the views of worker groups. And of course, those people that own concrete pumps and do concrete pumping. What union was involved? Well, the key union involved was the CFMEU. And then, of course, the employer group was Master Builders Queensland. Then there were a number of concrete pumping organisations and builders on the steering committee. So there was a broad range of groups. So then when, when we look at the code of practice, it's not just the view of one group, it's an overall view and that's reflected in the code of practice. The concrete pumping code of practice was updated to ensure that it remains responsive to industry needs. It reflects current industry best practice and is consistent with work health and safety laws. In Queensland, in health and safety legislation, the, there is the Work Health and Safety Act 2011, and then there's the Work Health and Safety Regulation 2011. The regulation has uh, specific laws, regulations that must be complied with. And then underneath the, the regulation are a number of codes of practice for different sectors of the industry and in these codes of practice it sets out minimum benchmarks that need to be used. It's also important to realise that the, the principles and codes of practice can be used in courts of law for prosecutions under the Work Health and Safety Act 2011. What are some of the main key changes with the new code of practice? As you can see in front of you, there are five key changes. Now I will go through each of these in greater detail during the webinar. One of the changes been made in the code relates to the number of workers that have to go out with each mobile concrete placing boom. Currently, in some situations, if the pump was fitted with certain safety features, then the line hand could actually be the pump operator as well. However, as time goes on, we've seen that this isn't always the safest option and there's been a key change made with the code of practice. And that key change relates to the number of workers with the pump. There have to be a minimum of two workers with the pump. So the line hand and the operator the line hand cannot be the same person as the operator. So why did the steering committee think that this was an important issue, having at least two people per concrete pump? Well, if you get, look at the particular slide of the concrete pump that's gone over on its side, this was an actual situation or an incident in West End in 2017 where the line hand was also the pump operator the line hand he was working on the formwork down in the uh, excavation and he was focusing on pouring the concrete now what happened was the unit sitting on, on top it was sitting on outriggers and one of these outrigger pads was sitting on a piece of timber that was bridging across the concrete slab to the retaining wall now unknown to the operator the vibration in the concrete pump caused it to gradually come off its outrigger pad 
and then it went over like you can see in the photograph. Now the consequences of this incident could have been very, very serious because they easily could have uh, resulted in the death of the line hand and the death of workers on the formwork. We then realised that it's not just to monitor the hopper, it's, that's not the only responsibility of the concrete pump operator. The concrete pump operator needs to monitor the overall safe operation of the unit. Therefore, the steering committee decided that it's necessary to have, as a minimum, two workers operating each mobile concrete placing boom. What about the concrete pump that you need to select for the particular job? The section in the code of practice on this particular topic looks at different issues on site. There needs to be a, a plan, a discussion between the builder and the concrete pumping organisation to work out what concrete pump is best for the job. For instance, what volume of concrete do you need supplied? What about the concrete mix design? Is that a, a specific mix that requires a specific type of pump? What about the delivery height and distance from the pore area? For some jobs, a line pump where the lines go along the ground might be okay, but for other jobs, it might be obvious that a boom pump is required. What about site access and condition? Is there room to set up the mobile concrete placing boom? What about cleaning out? Is there room on site to clean out the concrete pump? And there's all sorts of other concrete and construction issues that might be raised that can influence this topic. One of what about working under a concrete placing boom? What sort of risks are associated with a concrete placing pump and a boom? Sometimes, unfortunately, lines can burst, uh, pipe clamps can become dislodged. There could be a risk to workers around the concrete pump. So the new code, it specifies that only certain types of workers are allowed to be directly under the boom. And who are those workers? Well, the line hand and concreters involved in the deck pour. No other workers are permitted underneath the boom. Now it's directly under the boom. In addition to this issue, or a related topic, the code of practice now specifies that you can't have a concrete placing boom directly over site sheds, nor can you have the boom over designated access ways, unless in both of those situations, a 10 kPa or a 10 kPa kilopascal gantry is provided above either the site sheds or the access ways. Now you might say, look, why do we have to do this? This is a big change. Concrete placing booms shouldn't collapse. But unfortunately, the reality is that they do collapse. For example, during 2019, we've already had four incidents to date involving concrete placing booms where the booms have uh, collapsed or the outrigger box has failed and the unit has turned over. Just very briefly, what are these? In January, there was a 28 metre mobile unit where the, where the uh, ram on one of the cylinders between the second and third stage failed and then the boom collapsed to the ground. And then in June, there were two other incidents. In one of these, the boom on a 37 metre mobile unit a catastrophically failed and then the rest of the boom hit a roof house and then just recently a uh, 50 meter unit the linkage between the second and third stage failed and then that boom came down onto the formwork deck and in the other incident a 28 meter unit uh, the boom came down but in that case it wasn't a case of the boom failing it was the outrigger box failed and then the unit became unstable so clearly there is a risk with concrete placing booms and the new benchmarks on gantries over site sheds and access ways are there for a reason and also the restriction on who is under the under the placing boom is also necessary so as to minimize risk
Now a related topic has to do with the stability of concrete placing booms. There's a lot of new guidance in the code of practice on the stability of this sort of equipment. What are some of those topics that the code discusses? Well, ground factors, the presence of water, the type of ground, whether there's cavities or penetrations, whether there's a crust on the top of the ground, whether the unit is set up next to excavations and trenches. Also, there's guidance on timbers, pads and bog mats that go under the outrigger feet. There's also a new formula on calculating the ground pressure so that you can determine the outrigger pad size. And there's also information on short legging of units, the limited situations when you can do this. As you see in that picture there, the concrete placing unit it's overturned and the outrigger legs are deep in the ground. That's a particular example of what happens when the pad size isn't big under the outrigger feet. So how can we avoid this? We'll follow the guidance in the concrete pumping code of practice. Interestingly, the information in the code of practice is now more aligned with the mobile crane code of practice on ground conditions. For example, the timber size. Now the code specifies that the minimum size for timbers should be 200 millimetres by 75 millimetres. Distance from excavations when you're setting up the unit near to a, an excavation. What are the rules? Well for ground that's non-friable and by that I mean firm looking ground, the one-to-one -one rule applies where the outrigger foot must at least be the same distance away from the excavation as the depth of the excavation. And then for ground which is friable or crumbly, well then you increase the distance to two times the depth of the excavation. There's also warning in the code of practice about crusts on the ground surface where the surface can seem good, but it's only got a hard crust from the sun. And then more importantly, or most importantly, the calculation for operators to calculate ground pressure. Now in the code of practice, we have a formula that's quite straightforward. The good thing about most mobile concrete placing booms, most manufacturers now provide a downwards force for the operator to use. Now this might be in kilonewtons or in tons. It doesn't matter if it's in either of those units because you can use the formula that's in the code of practice. You can see that formula in the slide where it's simply to find out the pressure applied by the outrigger, you simply have to divide the force, the downwards force, by the area of the pad underneath. And there's different ways of which that formula is expressed. And then we have a example for you to use. The industry, or rather the manufacturers of concrete placing equipment have identified this issue for a number of years. And some of the manufacturers even have uh, information on the outrigger leg that the operator can use. So now the operator has much better tools in the code so that they can work out whether it's safe to set the unit up or not. And plus in the code of practice, there's some typical uh, bearing capacities for different ground conditions, whether they be hard rock or going right down to um, soft clay. And then the operator can compare the result of their formula to the information in the table. What about power lines? The code of practice now provides more guidance on working near overhead power lines, and these include planning, exclusion zones, and the role of a safety observer or a spotter. But one of the important changes in the code is that concrete placing booms should not be operated over the top of energized power lines. And why not? Well, because of the shape and the height of the boom, it doesn't allow for a large separation distance between the power lines, and the boom movement can be quite rapid. And also its difficulty for there is a difficulty for spotters observing 
the clearance to get this right. Sorry. What about concrete line blockages? Blockages in concrete pumping lines can be a complex issue in itself. There's a whole range of reasons why blockages occur. Some of them have mentioned in the code of practice and they're mentioned in the slide in front of you. They could be mixed design deficiencies, foreign matter in the concrete, a whole range of different issues. What about ways to avoid blockages? There again, there's a number of uh, ways listed in the code of practice. Of course, one rule doesn't apply to every type of blockage. Some of those things that are listed there are the need to clean out hoses and pipelines regularly, using a pump with adequate pressure for the line length and the concrete characteristics, minimising the number of bends and short bends. And there's other topics mentioned there. How about clearing blockages? One of the most important things to note with blockages is that all unnecessary persons needed to be excluded from the pipeline area because of the risk. Now, after locating a, locating a blockage, ensure that the line is no longer under pressure before attempting to clear it. Perhaps the pump needs to be reversed to reduce the pressure. But of course, this is a job for an experienced pump operator who's had a lot of experience with how to clear blockages in the past because if you don't do it the right way well then you can have, get drastic consequences. What about traffic control? The code of practice includes traffic control procedures that need to be applied. It's particularly important that these procedures are developed when there's more than one concrete delivery truck backing up to the concrete pump. This reminds me of a fatal incident about 15 years ago where a worker was killed. In this particular situation, it was a dual feed for the concrete pump. In other words, there were two uh, concrete delivery trucks that needed to back up to the concrete pump, back to the hopper. So why was the worker behind the trucks when they were backing up? Well, he thought to save time, he'd go down to the truck and as the truck was reversing up the hill, he would move the delivery chute on the back of one of the trucks. Now, as he was doing this, he slipped over and one of the trucks unfortunately backed over him and killed him. Very tragic situation. The information in the code of practice gave guidance on how to try and avoid these types of incidents. And you can see that there's a variety of information that's provided there. Uh, traffic control measures that may be considered include road closures, footpath closures, detours, siding and traffic controllers. And of course, for this activity, a safe, safe work method statement needs to be prepared. A new section in the Code of Practice relates to movement of delivery hoses for line pumps. Why was this new topic included? Well, it's to deal with manual handling issues. So what are the new benchmarks for handling concrete lines on the ground? Well, for pipe, where the pipe diameter is three inches or more, there needs to be one line hand for every 10 meters of workable hose. And when the pipe diameter is three inches or less, there needs to be one line hand for every 20 meters of workable hose. But keep in mind, this is for workable hose that's actually physically being moved. It's not for the total length of hose from the pump to the concrete pour area. There is comprehensive information in the revised code of practice on inspection requirements for concrete pumping equipment. There's more detailed information on annual and major inspections. So what are the different types of inspections that are required on concrete pumping equipment? 
was the daily inspection before the commencement of pumping concrete. There's the weekly checklist or the inspection. There's a monthly inspection, an annual inspection every 12 months, and a major inspection at intervals not exceeding six years. Now, the six-year major inspection, some may say, why have we maintained this in Queensland? Well, because it's probably the most reasonable and the fairest system that we can have. Some may say, why don't you base it on volume of concrete that's actually been pumped? Well, because volume of concrete pumped, now that relies on the good nature of most concrete pumping companies. Now, whereas most people in the industry will be honest, there'll be a minority of unscrupulous ones that might falsify hour meters on the pump. In addition, what about trucks that drive over rough roads? Simply basing a major inspection on the amount of concrete that the units pumped mightn't detect particular faults that have been caused to the pump. Also, there could be other issues like storing the pump outside so that there's corrosion. Unlike places like Germany, in Australia we don't have a highly regulated system for competent persons ex inspecting booms. So you can't use the German model in Australia. And the reality is that catastrophic failures of concrete placing booms are still occurring. As I mentioned before, we've already had four this year. Of all construction plant, concrete placing booms are exposed to some of the most severe loading. Unlike a crane, a concrete placing boom is exposed to cyclic loading or more regular cyclic loading than a crane. And dismantling the plant is still the best method to inspect those areas of the unit that are hidden during the annual inspection. You'll see a series of photographs in this particular presentation. In that first presentation, the outrigger box on a mobile concrete placing boom has failed. You can see where it's cracked. In a close-up view, you can see where the pencil is placed. Now on that particular unit, it was rusty up to where that pencil is. And then above that, that was a brittle failure. What does this mean? Well, these are particular things that should be picked up during the inspection. Now, certain things may not be clearly identifiable unless you have a closer inspection or you remove particular parts of the unit. And in some cases, you'll need to remove paint so that you can see if cracks exist. Now, the other photograph in that slide shows where a boss has failed. And, and the crack has been uh, cut out of that particular uh, end of that boom. This next uh, boom failure, this occurred at Miles in 2011. Now in this particular case, fortunately the, the line hand was able to get out of the way and this happened at the start of the job. As you can see from that photograph, the boom has snapped or catastrophically failed and the rest of the booms fall into the ground. As you can see, a close-up in these next photographs, this shows, the photograph on the right shows what's called a wear plate under the boom, and this prevents damage to the boom when the boom's folded up. And underneath that wear plate, if you see on the photograph on the left, you'll see where a crack's gone right through the boom. Now this is one spot where that crack would have been hidden from view, so nobody could see this. So if you looked for this visually, you wouldn't have been able to see this. But the photograph on the right actually shows some telltale rust, rust marks between the wear plate and the boom. This is an indication that there would have been problems in that. So with this particular incident, if this wear plate had been removed and the boom had been closely examined, then this incident could have been avoided. This is typically one of the issues that would, should be picked up during the six year major inspection. The six year major inspection, what does the major inspection need to include? 
Well, in a nutshell, the major inspection is to look at all of those parts of the placing boom that you can't look at during the annual inspection, all of the critical parts where a crack could be hidden or you might have rust that you can't see. And that's why you need to pull the unit apart. It's a comprehensive inspection that needs to be overseen by a registered professional engineer of Queensland. Where the manufacturer provides instructions and tolerances on parts, these need to be followed. So there needs to be tolerance checking or replacement of all critical bolts and pins. Of course, it has to include the outriggers and feet. Where a part's been replaced within two years, the engineer may decide not to dismantle in that area and non-destructive testing should be carried out by an independent uh, testing authority. But it's not much use having a comprehensive major inspection done unless you can prove what's been done. So with the major inspection, a, a pump owner needs to get a, a detailed report. What are some of the things that you need in that report? A summary of the history of the unit, a manufacturer's major inspection criteria where that might exist, extracts from the manual, list of work carried out on the boom, the names of persons involved, sign statements from people who have done work on particular components on the unit. So in a nutshell, it's got to be a detailed report for the unit. But you might say, my pump's done very, very little use. Why do I have to pull it apart? Well, there might be situations in which you can verify that your unit has very little work. In this case, it can't just be based on the owner saying that the unit hasn't done much work. There has to be a comprehensive written document that explains why a strip down or dismantling of the unit isn't necessary. And this might include tolerance checking of accessible components, a detailed knowledge of the specific make and model, so that the engineer knows that these units don't have a history of failure and a list of work that's been carried out on the boom. But I just need to stress that this is really the exception rather than the rule. When does the concrete pumping code of practice commence? It commences on 2nd of December 2019. What do you need to do if you're involved in the concrete pumping industry? You need to become familiar with the code, have a good read of it, make sure that you understand it. So thanks for your time and looking this webinar. And if you want any more information, go to our website.